everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, session on lawn care for spring and summer, uh, mainly oriented to homeowners in the uh, Atlanta and Fulton County areas of Georgia, uh, but also applying to uh, other people who reside in zones seven and eight uh, in, the, in the southern parts of the United States. Before we start our presentation, I, I hope most of you have downloaded the handout as well as which includes uh, three lawn care cal calendars. Uh, both the handout and the calendars will be useful for you to be looking at as we're going through this and we'll save you some time for writing down notes and things at that point. First, let's do a little housekeeping to get things started off. Uh, all of you are muted, so the no background noise will come across. If you want to ask a question, just click on the Q&A box and enter the question as we go through the presentation. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube as well as Facebook afterwards. And you'll be receiving a link to that in the email if you should like to look at it again or look at any of our any of our previous presentations. Uh, at the end of this, we will be asking you to fill out a survey. And we really hope you will, will answer that because it gives that, us an idea of whether you like the presentation how we could improve it, as well as suggestions for future classes. We are the North Fulton Master Gardeners. And the North Fulton Master Gardeners is a nonprofit volunteer organization. Uh, all of us have received training, education from the UGA Horticultural College. Uh, and our objective is to assist the residents of Fulton County with any horticultural questions they might have. We do this through these classes, as well as demonstration gardens that we have in North Fulton County. We offer children's classes as well, and we offer horticulture scholarships for kids going from high school into local colleges. This is the uh, fifth class in our series this spring. Uh, you, you see the uh, following classes that are will be coming up in the future. Uh, and we'll be talking about uh, the next class, Big Trees, right at the very end of this. Uh, there are way, various ways in which you can find out about these classes. You can sign up to receive emails uh, from us. Uh, we're also covered on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to look at any of our previous presentations, you can on the NFMG YouTube channel. My name is John Flagora. And I've been a master gardener since 2010. Uh, I moved down to Atlanta from Connecticut in 2007. And I realized at that point that I was really going to have to understand how to, uh, how to garden in this uh, heat of the Southeast. So I became a master gardener at that point in order to educate myself. Uh, I've always tended my own lawn, uh, but horticulture of all kinds is, is an interest area for me. Now, the objective of tonight's class, quite frankly, is to give you effective and practical information that you can use on how to take care of your lawn. Uh, I'll be explaining what you need to do, when you should be doing it, as well as when not to be doing it. Because depending upon the type of grass that you have, you'll be doing things at different times of the year. So this is our agenda. And uh, as we go, as you think of questions, please feel free to click on the Q&A. Q are. All classes have certain, certain all grasses, excuse me, have certain requirements. Every type of grass needs sun and at least, and it needs at least four hours of sun every day. Uh, 
when when the when it gets the sun it is also very very important and tall fescue is the most shot shade tolerant of the glass, grasses that we have down here all grasses need water but the amount needed depends upon the variety of the grass finally every grass needs nutrients because we mow it usually about once a week, we are forcing it to grow more that, than it really wants to do. So we need to add fertilizer and to add fertilizer at the right times to support the growth that it wants to do. In addition to that, the proper, the soil has to have the proper chemistry or pH so that the grass can absorb the nutrients through its roots. Now, if you look at all of these things, you can control water, you can control nutrients, but you can't control the sun. So the amount of sun you get is really, really important. I'm gonna start off talking about, talking about, excuse me, I clicked to the wrong slide. We're gonna start off talking about warm season grasses. Uh, and in North Georgia, Georgia that consists of hybrid Bermuda, and various varieties of zoysia. Uh, warm season grasses at this time of year are all dormant. They look, they have a straw color. Uh, and warm season grasses love hot weather. So they're dormant now. They only grow in the southern part of the United States. You almost always establish them using sod. But the wonderful part about them is they are very, very drought tolerant once they're established. Now, at the top of this slide, you're, you're seeing the annual life cycle of all warm season grasses. And right now they're dormant. Uh, they're not dead. They are still alive, but they just aren't growing at all. Uh, around the middle of April in our area, it starts getting warm enough that the grass recognizes that better get active. So starting around the middle of April until the middle of May, uh, middle of May it starts greening up. And usually by the middle of May, your warm season lawn is totally, totally green and it's actively growing. And it conti continues that all the way until uh, the end of September, beginning of October. At that point, the grass realizes that the days are getting a little bit shorter. It's not quite as warm. So it start, starts to slowly go dormant again. The reason I'm showing you this is that what we do has to contribute to this life cycle, this annual life cycle. Uh, you might be motivated to add fertilizer to your warm season lawn right now in March, but, but it's really a worthless thing to do. You want to wait until the grass is almost totally green before adding fertilizer because fer fertilizer motivates to grow more and it doesn't want to grow more until end of April, beginning of May. Similarly, we don't want to add fertilizer to the lawn in September because starting in October, your lawn is going to start slowing down and it wants to slow down. So the time to fertilize warm season grasses, as well as cold season grasses, depends on their life cycle. And we'll go into this more later on. The dominant variety of Bermuda uh, uh, that we find down here is called Tifway. Tifway needs at least six hours of sun each day. And it, and it doesn't want sun between eight o'clock in the morning and two o'clock in the afternoon. It needs sun from at least 11 o'clock in the morning until five o'clock in the afternoon. It wants that hottest part of the day. Uh, it struggles in part shade. So if parts of your lawn are get, getting shaded because, uh, uh, because the trees are growing taller, well, that's one of the consequences of, of Bermuda. It spreads by runners and these runners are quite aggressive. It has high drought and wear tolerance you mow it at about one and a half to two inches. Uh, I'd recommend one and a half inches in the spring and in the fall. And then as the weather gets hotter, uh, mow it at two inches. And we always fertilize in May, no earlier than May, 
definitely fertilize again in July. Uh, you can optionally fertilize in June and August if you want to give it a little more of a growth spurt. And there's another variety of Bermuda that just came out and well, it came out in 2009 and it's called Tiff Grand. And the only reason I'm mentioning Tiff Grand is that it tol tolerates a little bit of shade, it still wants a lot of sun. But if you have a Bermuda lawn right now and on the edges, it's not getting as much sun as it used to, you could add a tip uh, Tiff Grand sod in those areas where it's thinning out. Uh, and it would blend in very, very nicely with your existing Bermuda lawn. Uh, you mow it at the same height uh, and you fertilize it definitely in May and July. And give it a little more in June if you want to fill in more. With zoysia, also, also it prefers full sun. There are three varieties though. The dominant variety is Meyer. Uh, the second variety is Xeon, which has a thinner blade than Meyer. It looks like a tall fescue blade, it's that thin. Uh, the advantage over Meyer is it tolerates a little bit of shade, but it still wants at least five hours of sun a day. Emerald is the third uh, major type. It looks just like Xeon, it's not quite as, as strong as the end, but it's a perfectly good, perfectly good grass. Zoysia grow by slow growing runners, so it doesn't expand as quickly as Bermuda does. You mow Bermuda a little bit higher, two inches in the spring and fall, and two and a half once the really hot weather uh, uh, hits us in uh, July and August. And you fertilize it definitely in May, Definitely in August, not after that. And you, you can give it a little more juice in June if you want. Now, cool season grasses. And in North Georgia, that mainly tall fescue. And once in a while, you, we find people have bluegrass down here, but almost everybody has tall fescues. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. Tall fescue likes the temperature between 60 and 85 degrees. So when, uh, when our warm season grasses are really getting active is when tall fescue really doesn't want to be active. The virtue of tall fescue is it remains green all year. So it ha has that nice look to it. it. It grows all across the United States. You normally establish it using seed and the one downside to tall fescue is that you've got to water it. It needs water every single week. It can't handle drought. If we look at this life cycle, your, your, your lawn right now, throughout the winter and right now, it's not dormant. It's, it's been growing all winter long, but very, very, very slowly. But starting around this time, by the middle of March, it starts actively growing. Uh, by the beginning of April, it's usually in full swing and it's growing full, full, uh, full speed. And it keeps doing that until around the middle of June. Middle, around, middle of June is when we normally find temperatures hitting 85 and sometimes 90 degrees. And the fescue grass recognizes that. And in order to handle that heat, it slows down its growth. So in July and August, if you have a fescue lawn, you know, know that you don't have to mow it nearly as much. Uh, but then starting in September, as days get shorter, fescues start to, uh, to become active again and is actively growing un until the middle of November. The key to take from this chart is that in order to cooperate and reinforce the life cycle, we start to fertilize uh, tall fescue in March, but we don't fertilize it in June and July and August because that's when we don't want to motivate its growth. And then we start fertilizing it again in September and sometimes in late November. One of the th th interesting things about all plants 
is it takes them about a year to get established. Being established means the root system has become, has grown enough that it can really support, support the plant. It takes about a year for that to happen. Some of you are, might be tempted to, if, if you've got a fescue lawn, might be tempted to overseed in March or April. And the difficulty with doing that is your lawn will really look good in June, but then in July and August when the heat hits, that new grass really isn't established well enough. It gets hit by the heat and it dies. So it's usually a fool's errand to overseed in March and April, unless you've got something like a big event, a wedding coming up in your home in June and you really want it to look nice. But the best time to overseed fescue or to plant fescue is in September, because then it's got all fall, all winter, and all spring to get established until the hot weather starts hitting it in June. It has a much higher likelihood of surviving. Uh, fall fescue prefers morning sun and afternoon shade. Once that temperature gets to 85 degrees, it gets stressed. It needs an inch of water a week. It has to have it. So you've got, to, realistically, you've got to have an in-ground irrigation system to do it. Tall fescue does not spread. It grows as a seed and it never expands from that seed. So some of your tall fescue is going to, is going to die every summer. So you usually need to overseed in September. When you mow tall fescue taller at two and a half inches during the spring and the fall and three and a half inches in the summer. In the summer, you want it taller so, so there's more shade on the soil and therefore the soil stays a little bit cooler. We definitely fertilize in March and September and you can give it additional fertilizer in May and November if you'd like. So this slide shows the comparison between the warm season grasses and the cool season grasses as, as to how they grow differently. Uh, some of you may have both types of grass on your property. Maybe your backyard is a little shadier than your front yard. So perhaps your front yard is a warm season grass and in your backyard might be, might be fescue. There's nothing unusual about that, but it, what it does mean is you're going to have to mow them a little different. You're going to have, have to water that tall fescue uh, regularly in the summertime when it's dry. Uh, and you'll be fertilizing them at different times of year. One of the best things that you can do for your lawn is to have a soil test performed or perform a soil test. Grass grows best when the soil chemistry, the soil pH is being between 5.5 and 6.5. And that's just a measure of the acidity versus alkalinity of the soil. The reason why this is important is that if your soil is outside of that range, the roots can't uh, take up the nu nutrients from your fertilizer as effectively. So you'll put down fertilizer, but only 50 or 60% of it will be, will be utilized. And in North Georgia, it's not unusual for soil to be, have a pH of under five and a half. Uh, soil pH just naturally gets lower every single year, not drastically lower, it goes down to like six to 5.8 to 5.6 from year to year. But sooner or later, it will be uh, it will be too acidic. It will be be below five and a half. And the only way you're going to know that is through a soil test. You can easily do that yourself by, by taking samples of your of your soil, uh, and you need to collect at least one and a half cups of soil uh, from eight to twelve to twenty random spots on your on your lawn. Uh, and get it about four inches deep. So you get just a little bit out of each of those and mix them together. 
What I use it is a fairly narrow trowel, just like this one, where I can just plunge it into the soil about four inches deep uh, on four sides, about an in inch and a half square, withdraw that uh, wedge from the soil and just take the bottom in inch of that soil, uh, put it on some newspaper and do it about 15 more times so I can get at least one and a half cups. And then I've got enough soil. Uh, now comes the hard part. Uh, you have to take the soil to the county extension office, which in North Fulton is in Sandy Springs on Roswell Road. The soil test will cost you $12. It's payable by check, Visa, or MasterCard. The extension office is open on Tuesday, you know, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's only open on Tuesdays between 10 and 2. However, if that's not convenient for you, you can drop it off any day, Monday through Friday from nine to five. The, uh, all the information on how to leave the sample is outside of the extension office door. It's very, very clear. And once you've left it there, you'll be called back, back and you have to give you your, your credit card number over the phone. The good part about this is once you've done it, within one to two weeks, you'll get the results from the uh, UGA soil test office. And it'll tell you what the pH is as well as, as, well as the uh, major nutri nutrients in your soil. And it'll make recommendations to you on how to correct anything. If you need to raise the pH, that's uh, just a matter of getting granular or dolomitic lime, putting it on the soil. It takes about six months to affect this change. So the best time to lime your soil is in November, so you have it ready for March and April. But if, you're, if your pH is low, it is good to do it at any time. It's good to do it as soon as possible. Watering. All grasses want one inch of water a week. But the important part is to water deeply, not necessarily frequently. You can water once a week. I water twice a week. But the objective is to put enough water down on the lawn and in one or two applications. So the water goes deep enough in the soil that the roots have to go down into the soil in order to get the water. If you water more than more than two or three times a week, you're going to be babying your lawn, and the root, roots don't have to go deep uh, to get water. And when, when the roots are closer to the surface, then they get hotter in the summertime, and it makes it harder for them. The best time to water is between eight o'clock at night and 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and, and within that time period, 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. is even better. Uh, we discourage daytime watering, not, on, not only because it, of the effect of evaporation, but everybody's soil has fungus spores in it. Mine does, yours does, everybody does. And these funguses are just waiting to erupt to get their, their time. They're an opportunistic uh, creature. Uh, it takes about 14 to 15 hours of wetness on grass for, for the fungus to emerge, to have the conditions that a fungus likes. So that if you water at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, and if your grass is still damp when it gets to eight o'clock at night when the sun goes down, your grass is going to be wet, damp for 15 hours. And that's exactly what fungus likes. It's not a guarantee you're going to get it, but you're encouraging it at that point. So water once to twice a week. If you have tall fescue, you're going to have to do that during the summertime, the intense heat and do it at night or very, very early in the morning. Just a little bit about basics of mowing. Uh, 
Keep your mower blade sharp. Usually once a year, year is enough to do that. When you are mowing, you don't want to take off more than one third of the length of the blade at a time. Uh, every time you mow your lawn, you are injuring it a little bit. But if you don't take off more than a third, it should be able to recover very, very easily. So if your grass is three inches high, you can take off one inch, and that's one third, and you've got it down to two inches. It's good if you can vary direction of mowing. It's best to mow when the grass is dry. Uh, and when we get to the heat of the summer, it's best to mow it later in the day rather than, rather than earlier in the day, because then it has cooler temperatures to revive itself. If any of you are bagging your clippings, uh, I, I would recommend that you, that you not do that. As long as you're only taking off one third of the blade of grass, your clippings will be small enough that they will decay on the lawn itself. And that provides nutrients to the lawn. And so what I do is I, I mow my lawn. Uh, there are clippings on top of the lawn, sometimes in, sometimes in clumps. So I just get out my blower and I blow them so they're dispersed around the grass, but they stay on the grass and add to the, uh, add to the ultimately add to the, the nutrition in the soil. Okay, we're coming to a break point right now. So if any of you do have any questions, uh, Mary, it's your turn to take over. All right, uh, give me just one minute to get organized here. Um, we'll just get started right away. Um, should I fertilize before or after? scalping azoita lime? Uh, sc scat scalping is not something you really need to do. Uh, I don't do it. Uh, you, you can do it, but it's a real, really no value. Uh, scalping will um, help your lawn green up a little faster, but if you have weeds growing in your lawn, and particularly poa anoa, which we will discuss later on, uh, scalping is just gonna expose these germinating weeds to more sunlight and help them grow more. If you really wanna scalp, you can, but if, you, if I were you, I wouldn't fertilize until the prescribed time, whether that's for, uh, your, your fescue grass doing it in March or your uh, warm season grass doing that in May. Scalping has nothing to do with fertilizing. Okay. For zoysia, please discuss whether to aerate and dethatch. Tips are suggested on suggestions on renting equipment. I'll be, talking about, I'll, be, okay. I'll be talking about aerating shortly. Gotcha, okay. What is the best way to fill in dips and valleys in both Fescue and zoysia lawns. I'll talk about that shortly. All right, keep me honest. Um, best time to plant warm season grasses. I'll bet you'll talk about that later. Um, uh, yes, we do. Okay. Um, how can you eliminate moss and fescue? And what are the best products to use? Talk about that later. Okay. Um, ah, here's one. I have fescue, my, brother, my neighbor has Bermuda. Our lawns were established 30 years ago and the Bermuda is creeping in. We oversee fescue every fall. Do you have any tips? That, that's a tough situation for you because uh, that Bermuda grass is always gonna wanna try to, to grow into your lawn. Uh, uh, I don't really have a good suggestion for you. Uh, you almost have to ju just uh, put up with it, and let them let them battle each other out. Okay. Um, how do you how do you tell what types of grass you have? You'll probably cover a lot of that um, later on as well. Well, if you if if you have if your grass is green now, by definition, you've got tall fescue. Okay. If your grass is straw colored. You've got either Bermuda or Zoysia. 
Now, the characteristics of Bermuda, Bermuda are, it's a little more blue-green in color when, it, when it's active, but it's also a very stiff, almost a prickly plant. If you were to walk on it in your bare feet, you, you notice it, it doesn't hurt your bare feet, but, but you notice it. If you've got a zoysia lawn, no matter what variety of zoysia you have, uh, zoysia is not prickly. It's got a nice, rich green color. Uh, it's almost like you're it, it, walking on a uh, plush carpet when you walk on, on zoysia grass in your, uh, uh, in your lawn. It's, it's very dense and thick and plush and soft. That's, those are the easiest ways to distinguish between the two. Nice. All right, how do you tell what type of grass you have? I've only been in Georgia for a few years. Oh. Well, I, th I think I just answered that. Well, you did just answer that, sorry. But, um, and, and, if, and if you have any further questions, you can just go to local pipes, pikes, or your extension office, and so, somebody can help you there. Well, and Google works too. Um, is it possible to buy tif Tifton grass, Tif grass grass uh, as seed rather than sod? No, it's not. Uh, these seeds, these hybrid Bermudas uh, are sterile. They, they, they produce seeds, but the seeds are sterile. Uh, and in a way that's good, be good. So the way Bermuda grows, uh, it can be so aggressive. It, it would be growing into your shrubbery beds uh, a mile a minute and also dropping its seeds there. So you get even more of it. Uh, so no, no, there is not, there are seed, seeds for other types of Bermuda, but they aren't as uh, industrial strength and as good as the hybrid Bermuda we're talking about. Okay, perfect. Um, emerald zoysia grass, what does not as strong mean? Well, you're a little more prone to diseases and fungus but my neighbor i've got i've got zeon my neighbor next door neighbor has emerald and his lawn is just as good as mine so i'm, I'm giving you theory in this uh, emerald was developed before zeon so zeon is a little bit better but emerald is a perfectly good variety okay all right, so why don't we leave the rest of the questions until the end um, and any that you don't answer in the rest of your presentation, we will get to. Sure, okay, so here we go. Because we are mowing our lawns as frequently as we do, we have to fertilize. Uh, lawns in particular need nitrogen and potassium. And when you, when you look at a fertilizer, it, it always has three numbers with it. The first number is the percentage of nitrogen. The second number is the percentage by weight of phosphorus. And the third number is the percentage of potassium. Uh, the first number, nit the nitrogen number is always higher than the others. The nitrogen contributes to the green blade growth, the green leaf growth of any plant. And so when we're mowing it all the time and yet we want it to keep growing, we need a high level of nitrogen. Uh, the potassium is good for roots as well as the overall health and vigor of the plant. And that's always gonna be a lower number. Now, there are chemical uh, varieties of fertilizers and they're now organic varieties. And when you see an organic formulation in that, Organics are normally made out of uh, chicken manures, poultry manures, turkey, stuff like that. Uh, they don't smell, uh, so you don't have to worry about that problem. Uh, when you are putting it down on your lawn, a uh, broadcast uh, spreader is usually the best way to do it. Uh, so you get these, any one of these uh, fertilizers in, in a bag a granular mix. You either follow your soil test recommendations on how much to apply, or you look at the recommendations on, on the back of the bag. Uh, 
uh, frankly, I would rec recommend the recommendations on the back of the bag. If your grass doesn't look vigorous enough and have, doesn't have a good rich color, that means it probably doesn't have enough nitrogen in it. And if it's, if it's got too much nitrogen in it, uh, that's not good either. It'll be growing too fast. Uh, it'll just have problems when you do that. Uh, one of the things that, that I noticed in my lawn is I had been using chemical fertilizer for years and years and years. And about seven years ago, I noticed on my Xeon lawn that I, I had put in four years later, that on one section where it got a little more shade than other, other sections, that it was starting to thin out. I thought it was getting enough sun, however. So, so what, what I decided to do is just to try out an organic fertilizer as opposed to a chemical one. And I use the fertilizer here called uh, Scott's Natural. And what I found is that uh, four months later, the lawn was no longer, that part of the lawn was no, no longer starting to thin out. And a year, year later, the lawn was starting to rejuvenate itself in those places. Uh, chemical fert fertilizers were wonder wonderful developments, but any chemical fertilizer leaves a chemical salt, chemical salts, various chemical salts in the soil itself. And these chemical salts are not good for or organic, organic life, the mi microorganisms that are in the soil. So the, re the, the reason to use an organic is to encourage the growth of all of those microorganisms that, are, that should be hopefully in your soil. Uh, Organic fertilizers can be a little bit harder to find. Uh, what I had found is that Home Depot used to carry the Scott's Natural. That's how I found out about it. And now I can get, get it at the internet. It cost me no more money than it did at Home Depot. And it gets delivered right to my door. So I don't even have to go, go out and get it and bring it home. So I encourage you to consider using an organic fertilizer. But if you're... If you find it easier to use chemical ones, it, they'll, 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 do, they'll do well for you. Someone asked about aerating lawns. And aerating lawns is really very important down here in Georgia. Uh, we, we all know what red Georgia clay is like. Uh, it's, when, it, when it's wet, it is heavy and it is moisture laden, and there is actually no air pockets at all. It's the reason why, why we have so many brick homes down here in the Southeast. Uh, and when we get into the hot of the, the heat of the summer, uh, that red Georgia clay gets dried out very, very quickly, and it is hard, hard, hard as can be, and very difficult to, uh, very difficult to break up. And all of this may, makes it difficult for roots of any plant, particularly grass roots. Uh, the, the grass roots are, are the way the grass gets nutrition, as well as air, as well as water. So even though the grades of bla blades of grass are in the air, almost all the air supplied to the plant is through the roots. So it's very, very useful every one to four years. And one to four, four years really depends upon how much activity your lawn gets. If kids are playing on it a lot, you might need to do it every one to two years. Uh, you, I re re recommend the yeah, have a, a core aerating done. And you can go to Home Depot and rent a core aerator for a half a day or a day. And all this is is a gas powered machine that has uh, hollow metal cores uh, sticking out of a drum. And these cores, uh, these cylinders are pushed into the soil. And as the drum rotates, the core com comes out of the, uh, out of the cylinder itself. And then those brown uh, uh, cylinders you see on the soil or what the core look, looks like when, when it's been taken out of the soil. Uh, and you do, do the, this to your lawn 
and that opens up openings in your lawn. It's easier if you water your lawn before in hand uh, because you don't want it to be dry and hard. And those cores that you find, you can just leave like that on your lawn. They'll, they'll decompose in two to three weeks. Or you can go around with a hard rake and simply tamp on them and break them up a little. The main reason you're doing this is so that air can now get down to the roots. But it's also good if you buy some bags of topsoil and just broadcast it around your, your lawn. What you would like to have happen is for that topsoil, some of it to go into those openings in the soil and start filling it in because that now enriches the soil and allows the soil to breathe a little bit in the future. Uh, core aerating is not easy to do. As I said, you, you can rent, rent one, rent a machine at Home Depot or Lowe's, but they're heavy. They are not easy to use. And unless you've got a, a husky, athletic, 16, 18 year old son that, that can help you with this, uh, I would recommend you consider uh, hiring a lawn service to do it for you. It is not expensive to do and is very worthwhile. Weed control. With just a couple of exceptions, I'm not going to talk about particular weeds. Because for the most part, you don't need to know what, what particular weed is, is plaguing you at any time of the year. Weed, weed, weeds are classified in two different categories. Grassy weeds, and grassy weeds look, look like grass. Crabgrass is a grassy weed. Uh, orchard grass, very, very thick grasses. They look like grass. They're a, they're a grassy weed. Poa anua, which I'll talk about later, is a, is a very, very difficult to control grassy weed. Anything that doesn't look like a, a grass is called a broadleaf weed. So dandelions, clover, chickweed, things like that are non-grassy weeds, so therefore they are broadleaf weeds. Every one of these two categories, each of these two categories have both annual varieties and perennial varieties. And both of them have spring, summer, fall, and winter varieties. So there are weeds that can plague us all year long. And the best deterrent for, a, for weeds is really to have a healthy, thick, dense law of them. So really what, what we are trying to do in this presentation and everything we've been talking about and will be talking about it is to allow you to contribute to that, to the health of your lawn so that it does fill in. And Bermuda and Zoysia in particular, if you take care of them, they will fill in. Uh, so the first thing to do, to do is to start using a pre-emergent weed preventer. Now these weed preventers, and sometimes they're called crabgrass preventers, they're the same thing. Uh, they last for eight to 12 weeks. So you put it down and at the most, they're gonna last you three months. Uh, so you, we put them down uh, at this time of the year, and we put them down three months later, uh, and you'll put them down in the early fall, and you'll do them in the late fall, early winter as well. There are no good organic uh, pre-emergence uh, available, none at all. So chemical products are your only practical solution. They will eliminate most of your weeds, but not all. They're not going to eliminate perennial, perennial weeds that are already, already established in your lawn. So for any survivors, the best method to get rid of them is hand, weed, hand weeding. But with, with really just a couple of exceptions, and I'll talk about those in a minute, hand weeding is generally a very, very effective way to get rid of the survivors. Grassy weeds can be very, very difficult. If they aren't taken care of by a pre-emergent, uh, 
you've got a problem on your hands because there is no selective killer for most active grassy weeds. So if the pre-emergent doesn't do it, hand weeding, if, if, it's, if it's not too extensive for you, is the best way to get rid of them. There are, there are two exceptions to this. The first exception is a weed called, a grassy weed called nut sedge. And I've shown a picture of it on the screen there. Uh, I wasn't familiar with nut sedge until I moved down here to Atlanta from Connecticut. And I've always been accustomed to, if I see a weed, I'll just plop it out of the ground, cut it out of the ground. And I, I did that initially with some, some nut sedge that I found on my, in my lawn. I didn't have too much of it, but I found out that it kept coming back. Now, nut sedge looks like a grass. It grows faster than the Bermuda or Zoysia. And at, at the tip of it, tip of a stem that comes up, up you'll see, see a seed head that almost looks like a globe. Um, the reason this is called nut sedge is it has very, 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 very fine roots. So if you dig it out of the ground, you're gonna, you're gonna sever those roots, but at the, at the end of those roots is a nut. And that's a seed for a new nut sedge plant. So the most effective way to get rid of nut sedge is to either you can purchase a liquid sedge killer that you can spray on these plants. It, it does not hurt the surrounding grasses. But if you only have a little bit of nut sedge, then the, frankly, the easiest thing to do is to get a hold of Roundup, uh, pour it in a little container. Uh, I, I use a, a foam paint brush like I'm showing right here. They cost about 98 cents at, at Home Depot or Ace Hardware. Uh, and I just paint the, 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 the blades of this nut sedge grass, uh, ca carefully making sure the Roundup doesn't land on desirable grasses or desirable plants. And I usually have to do this two to three times at weekly intervals but it kills the nut sedge. You might find some more next year because those are, are from uh, nuts that have been left in the ground from previous plants. But if you keep at it for two or three years, you will get rid of it all. The real scourge in the South, the Southeast, uh, particularly for warm season grass lawns is a weed called Poa Anua. And it's sometimes also referred to as annual bluegrass, but most, most people do call it by its Latin name, Poa Anua. Poa Anua germinates during the fall and the winter. So that when your lawn is dormant, that, that's when Poa Anua really loves it. You might see it starting in December or early January. But generally, it's in late January or fe February where it truly becomes noticeable. It has a nice light green color, um, has lots and lots of seeds. It's a prolific seed produ producer. Any, uh, every Poa Anua plant will generate hundreds of seeds. And these seeds really survive for many years. Uh, the poa will die generally in late May, early June. But if you just leave it there, it's going to drop its seeds and come back more next year. And, and it's occupying space for a while that your uh, Bermuda or your zoysia could, could, be, could be occupying and growing into. Uh, there is no selective post-emergent control for poa anima. So if you got just a little bit of it, you can hand weed. The roots are not very strong. It, it's easy to take out of the ground, uh, particularly when it's very, very, very young. But if you've got lots of it, it's not worthwhile. Now, let me talk a little bit about uh, what pre-emergence you should be using. There are many uh, fertilizers out there, weed and feed fertilizers out there that, 
that advertise them the, themselves as weed killers and pre-emergent. However, you will be putting down a pre-emergent frequently at times when you're not gonna be putting down a fertilizer. It's not good for the grass to do it that way. So when, when I'm talking uh, putting down a, a pre-emergent, I mean something that is just a pre-emergent and doesn't have fertilizer with it, doesn't have nitrogen fertilizer with it. Uh, Scott's Halt is a pre-emergent. It's a crabgrass preventer. It's a pre-emergent. It works fine. Uh, if you've got a, a Home, Deep, Home, Home Depot handy, you can get a product made by a company called Lesco, L-E-S-C-O, and it is a pre-emergent. They consider it a fertilizer because it's a 007 formulation. There's no nitrogen in it, however, ever so. so so it's not going to motivate your lawn to grow. And you can put this on, on the ground at any time. It's called 007 Pre-M. And you can get it at any Lowe's. You can also get it at any uh, Site 1 landscaping locations. And I recommend you definitely look for a pre-emergent that is not a fertilizer. Broadleaf weeds, on the other hand, are fairly easy to get rid of. There are lots of chemical sprays, selective chemical sprays, and granular products that are available. So if, if you've got broadleaf weeds uh, over your entire lawn, you'll probably want to put down a granular product. But if, if you've just got them in small areas, uh, you can get a, a liquid spray whether it's uh, in ready to use form, formula format or whether it's in a, uh, uh, or whether it's something you need to dilute. And to, you can just spot spray small oil areas as you see these weeds come up. It's important, however, to try to kill these weeds before they flower because the flat flower contains the seeds. And you can kill the plant with uh, with a spray, but you don't kill the seed. So, so the whole idea of doing spraying is to do it before the flowers emerge. And obviously when, when you do this, you've got to be careful about trees, shrubs, and flowers. You, you don't want to inadvertently hit them. So now is when you can be looking at your lawn care calendars that you downloaded, and I'll, I'll just review with you the major tasks that you should be doing and, and when to do them. Right now is the time to put down a pre-emergent weed for, for your warm season grass, right? Right now is the best time to put down a pre-emergent weed preventer. And do it in, as, in early, early March, do it, do it by the middle of the month. And this will control crabgrass over the summertime as well as most spring weeds that'll sprout, annual spring weeds that'll uh, sprout through, uh, through seeds. In February and March, add lime if your soil test shows that. But again, if your soil test sh shows you need it, do it at any time of the year. In April and May, the more you put down the second pre-emergent, and that's optional if you had a lot of if you had a lot of summer weeds or crabgrass last summer, I would do it again. If you, if you had just a little bit, it's probably optional and you don't need it. In May uh, is when you uh, apply your first fertilizer. In May through June is the best time to core aerate that when your grass is really growing actively. Uh, so when you core aerate, at that point, you're not gonna be injuring it too much. It's ready to respond, come right back. Uh, if you're gonna put down a new lawn or if you have lay sod in, in, in particular areas where it's a little bit thin, um, May through August is the best time to do it. You can do it at other times of the year, but it's best in May through August. And you'll have to prepare and improve the soil before you do that. And we'll go, 
go over that right at the very end of the presentation. Uh, you'll do additional fertilizing uh, in July and August for Bermuda and in June and August for Zoysia. Now for your tall fescue, pre-emergent is the exact same, exact same schedule. So you'll do it now. Uh, if, you're, if, if you feel you need to overspray, overseed this spring, then you don't want to put down a pre-emergent. But as I said earlier, earlier in this session, unless you have to do it for some event type reason, it really is almost useless to overseed in the spring. Wait until September. Uh, again, add lime as soon, as soon as you find out that you need it, if you do need it. Uh, fertilize in March. Uh, in late April or in May, you'll apply your second pre-emergent if, if you think you're going to need it. Uh, in May, you're going to fertilize again for the second time but you're not gonna fertilize again until September. And you don't aerate uh, tall fescue in the spring or in the summer. You wait, you, you wait until September when the grass is really gonna be growing the most. And that's when you're gonna be overseeding anyway. So now we'll talk about a question that uh, one of you had if you have any low spots on your lawn, uh, you can gradually raise the level of the soil, but you're gonna to wanna to do it about oh, a quarter of an inch at a time. You're gonna go out and buy some uh, uh, topsoil. You, you can mix in some play sand if you want, or just <clears throat> use topsoil itself and, and just spread it over that low area. Uh, about a quarter of an inch deep. Uh, you, can, you can make it up to a half an inch deep if you want to, but a quarter inch will be a little bit safer. You'll find that the grass will grow right up through that without injuring it. And once you think the grass has grown up enough, you can add, add another quarter of an inch to it. And keep doing that in uh, smaller low areas until they get leveled out. If it's a large area, then you're going to want to remove the grass, you know, skim it off the surface, uh, uh, fill that low spot. And, and since, you're, since, since you have the grass off at that point, you might as well dig the whole thing up, add organic matter, uh, really make that soil good, uh, fill it in so it's level, and then replant that sod that you that you skimmed off the surface. Grubs and moles. Almost all of our lawns down here have some grubs in them. Grubs are the larval stage of Japanese beetles. Grubs are in our, our lawns because they like to chew on the roots of grass. But generally, unless, unless you've got a lot of grubs in your lawn, it's not, it's not gonna really injure your grass all that much. The real problem is that moles, which are rodents that stay underground and they make tunnel through your lawn, uh, they can be a major annoyance. Uh, it doesn't look as nice, the grubs are out, uh, the moles are out there tunneling because they love to eat grubs. They also eat worms and insects, but they really, really love grubs. And uh, there are a lot of different ways you can try to get rid of them, but there's really only one practical way to do it, two practical ways. Uh, some people try to kill them with uh, traps. Uh, some people try to put poison bait in the tunnels. And once in a while that works, but the most effective way to do it is to use a chemical grub killer, which you, you can buy at any big box store. You apply it usually in mid June. You won't be, you, what your objective here is to kill the grubs 
that are going to be born in August because that's the easiest time to kill them. And after September, it's almost impossible to kill them. There is an organic way to do this, but it takes a lot of work. It's called milky spore. It's a biologic, con biologic control. It only affects grubs, so it's very, very safe to use. However, it takes, set, it takes real effort to put this milky spore into the ground. You have to put in a, in a mesh type network across your lawn. And that then it takes about three to four years for that milky store, milky spore, excuse me, to fill in. Once it does that, it does a great job. But it takes again some real effort and time on your part to accomplish that. Anytime we talk about pesticides and herbicides, we have to give these cautions to you. Before you buy it, read the label directions. Uh, then read them again. And when you get it home, read them for a third time. Make sure you are applying the, the right amount to the right crop at the right time. And if you have any questions at all and are unsure of many, call your local extension office. If you have dogs, you're gonna have patches of your lawn that die. Uh, if it's, particularly if it's a female dog. There are, there are solutions that you can, you can buy to make that a little bit better. Uh, you can also flush it immediately with water to try to, to dilute it. But if, if you've got a dog, you're going to have some spots on your lawn that, uh, that are affected by that. Some of you will find moss on your, on your lawn and moss is an opportunistic plant. You generally find it when you've got uh, too much shade, or the soil is too wet, or the soil is really, really, really poor condition. In other words, no organic matter in it at all. And it's also too compacted. So if you don't like the moss growing in your soil, what you've got to do is change the conditions around it, either give it more sun, improve, this, improve the grass, or remove grass and plant something else or just get along with the moss. If you got red ants or fire ant mounds in your lawn, there are lots of granular products that are available in big, big box stores. They all work and they all work well. As, as we said earlier, all grass needs sun. And, and, if, and if you're just not getting enough sun, even tall, even tall fast fuel isn't gonna work for you. Here are the th things you can consider doing. Uh, mow your grass higher uh, and fertilize it and water it less because it won't need as much. If you can let in more light by removing branches, more trees, that will help. But as our trees grow, grow taller, the canopy gets wider and there's gonna be more and more shade. There's not much you can do about that. Use tall fescue because that's the most tolerant of shade. But again, tall fescue does want some sun and likes that morning sun. You can also plant ground covers. Pachysandria is a wonderful, good looking ground cover as is periwinkle and there are others as well. You can convert that area into a shade or a woodland garden because there are many shrubs uh, that do like in shade and, and, uh, and thrive in shade. Underneath trees, you really should have, have mulch around the trees uh, rather than plying, trying to plant grass. The trees will appreciate it and your grass won't be struggling as much. Now let's talk very, very quickly about new lawns and bald, bald spots that we had referred to earlier. For cool season grass, the best time to plant seed is in the fall. Doing it in the spring, and I said, is very, very, very difficult. Uh, and no matter when you do put down uh, fescue seed, you don't want to pre-emergent in the soil because your seed seed will not uh, germinate. If you had a warm season grass, the best time to saw it is May through August when the grass is actively growing. 
So the 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 process you go through is uh, you can optionally kill whatever is there first using a, a broad spectrum herbicide like Roundup that'll kill everything. Uh, you can either skim that off once it's dead or, or you, you can dig it right into the soil. But you want to till that soil to a depth of four to six inches. Uh, remove any weeds, rocks, things, uh, building materials that are in the soil, obviously. Then you're going to want to incorporate organic matter. Put about two to three inches of compost, manure, organic soil conditioner, whatever you can find onto the soil and then take that tiller and mix it in again. Because that's the kind of soil that every, 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 every turf, turf grass would like to have. You add starter fertilizer, which, which is good for, for seed as well as sod. Uh, sm smooth it off, make sure it's got the right, right slope to it. Uh, then if you're seeding, you're gonna wanna spread that seed evenly and rake it in lightly. If you're using sod, you're gonna push those sod pieces together. Uh, you're gonna want them as close as possible as they can be. And then if you're sodding, you're gonna wanna roll the area in so that sod and seed and, and soil has very, very good contact. Because your objective with sod is to have those roots go into the soil as quickly as possible. No matter how you do it, you're gonna then wanna keep your soil moist for about the next two weeks. So you're just giving it a little bit, bit of water a couple of times a day to keep it moist, but not wet. And if you go through that process, you can have a successful lawn. Uh, I always end my presentation by going over resources that you can take advantage of. In North Fulton County, we've got a, an extension helpline. You can see it there. You can call that helpline at any time, Monday through Friday. Uh, if, if no one is at the office, you can leave a message, but someone will get back to you. Whether you have a lawn question, vegetable gardening question, perennials, shrubs, you can take advantage of this service. It costs you no, no money and you get somebody to answer your question for you. There are also many UGA publications that, that you can get online at no charge. And I've, uh, you've got them in your handout and I'm showing the, the, them here as to where you can go. Some of these publications are for farmers, but many of them are for homeowners and are understandable by homeowners. Uh, finally, we on our North Fulton Master Gardeners web, website, we have our community classes session where you can look up when classes are gonna be and you, you can plan ahead of time of what's gonna be available. So, so fin finally we're up for the last question session, but I'd also like to point out that our next uh, Zoom gardening session will be on March 7th at two o'clock in the afternoon. It's featuring Big Trees of Sandy Springs. Big Trees is an urban forest in the middle of Sandy Springs uh, that has been set aside for, for many years. It's, it's a pretty good size, uh, uh, pretty good size forest. And it's been developed with uh, native trees that have been there all the time, native shrubs, uh, native wildflowers, uh, native reptiles. Everything is, is, is as you would want it to be a, a native florist. And uh, we will be giving you a tour of this and give, giving you some ideas uh, as well as you might, might be motivated to, to enjoy it and come to it yourself. Okay, we're open to questions. Mary? the questions um, to stick with the topic. Um, first one, can you fertilize too much? Mary, I couldn't hear you very well. It would help if I put my microphone down, wouldn't it? Um, so the first question is, can you fertilize too much? You can, absolutely. 
Uh, in fact, let me point out two things. One is about fertilizer, the other is about watering. Uh, when, to know how much fertilizer to put down, you follow the recommendation on the bag. But the bag also tells you how much should go for, how much should be applied for every 10,000 square feet of the lawn. So if, if, you, if you can get an approximate idea of where you're, how much square feet of lawn you have, and if you weigh the amount of material you put into your spreader and, and then how much is left over afterwards, you'll know how much you've applied. And then you can know how much you've applied per 10,000 square feet. Uh, that's what I do. It might seem a little anal, uh, but then that's where you find out what your what your broadcast spreader setting should be for the fertilizer that you're using. And another thing that I forgot to mention is about watering. If, if you've got an in-ground irrigation system, there's no way that you can calculate how much time your irrigation system should be on in order to apply, say, a half inch of water. And the only thing you can do is to take pans and put, put, put the in various spots on your uh, uh, on the, on the zone that you're worried about the, that you're working on, turn on your irrigation for about 15 minutes, and see how much water, on average, has collected in each one of those pans. And that's a way for you to determine how, how much time it takes to put a half inch or an inch of water down on your lawn. There's no other way to do it. Mary. All right. All right. Okay, so right. if you have a combination lawn of warm season and cool season grasses, mm -hmm. which fertilizer pre-emergent and seeding schedule would you follow? Well, you for for your tall fescue, you follow the uh, the, the tall fescue calendar. And for your warm season grass, you follow the warm season calendar. You, you do your fertilizing at different times. You do your pre-emergent at the same time. Uh, you do your aerating at different times. You, you, it's, right on, it's right on your lawn calendar. Uh, that's why we uh, included those in your handout. Uh, take them out of your handout, put it on your garage wall, or put it someplace where you, you can easily refer to it. All righty. Is it OK to aerate? A lawn using an attachment on a rototiller that slices holes into the soil. Um, you probably could do that. The the difference, though, is that you, you're trying trying to open up the soil three to four inches deep. And at, from what you're describing to me, that sounds like you, you're trying to get rid of thatch because you're not, not really going into the soil. Uh, so I would definitely recommend using a core aerator, um, either rent one or have, have some lawn service do it for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> there is a question about, is there a spot weed killer for spot killing established weeds, I assume Roundup or something like you said, be careful not to spray the grass. Yeah, uh, uh, well, Roundup, yeah, be very, 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 very careful with obviously. Uh, and that's why I use that fame, uh, a foam paintbrush, you just carefully paint. Uh, you can do it on not only nutsedge, but uh, uh, onion grass and things like that that are easy to paint, paint and not get it on the desirable grass. Okay. Uh, broadleaf weed killers though, liquid broadleaf weed killer, uh, you don't have to be particularly careful with because they don't harm grass. But again, read the label directions. There are lots of broadleaf weed killers out there and almost all of them are, are safe for all grasses, but read the directions ahead of time carefully. Okay. If you have weeds in your lawn, should you bag the clippings? I guess so that you don't spread weed seeds into the grass. 
You know that that that's a diff that's a difficult question. Um, if you've got weeds, but the seeds aren't showing, then I wouldn't worry about it. The, you know the seeds or 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 the flowers. Um, if they if they are showing, you could bag it, but just realize bag the clippings, but just realize that you're going to have to fertilize it a little more. Um, the the key here is to follow follow these uh, recommendations as much as possible, so that hopefully a year from now you don't have as many weeds in your lawn, and your lawn is a little more dense. If you've got Bermuda or zoysia, you know within a year your lawn should, if it's getting enough sun, it should be dense enough that weeds are not a major problem. Okay. Um, you may have answered this, but it's a little specific, so I'm going to just float it out there. Um, do pre-emergence hurt fescue? I don't believe they do. Uh, there are there are many different pre-emergence pre that are available, uh, and, th and there are many different chemicals different chemicals that are that are used in them. Uh, I'm not aware that they cause problems for tall fescue, but if they do, it would be clearly indicated on the package. On the package. It really would. They'd be very, very clear about that as to what to use it on and what not to use it on. Okay. Um, how can I care and properly drain the lawn if it's overwatered from all this rain that we've been had that we have had recently, and particularly given that we live in Georgia and have clay soil? There's not really much you can do about that. that uh, turf grasses are very, very hardy, and they can they can handle a lot of abuse. Uh, the rain that we've been having. If, it, if it's causing some puddling in certain areas, then I, if I were you, I would, I would try to raise them up or, or as I said before, dig, a, dig, a, dig the area out, you know, skim the grass off and then uh, level it off as well as enrich the soil at the same time. Uh, but grasses are pretty, pretty tough critics. They can, they can handle a lot as long as we fertilize them and, and Try to minimize the weeds. All right. What is the hardiest grass for part shade? Well, if you're talking about part part shade, if you're talking about shade in the afternoon and sun in the morning, you want fescue. It's as simple as that. Right. If you have sun in the afternoon, you want a warm season grass because fescue doesn't like afternoon sun in Georgia. When I lived in Connecticut, I had a tall fescue lawn and it got sun all day and it didn't mind it because the temperatures didn't get as intense. But down here, you don't want tall fescue get afternoon sun. That afternoon sun is important here. Critical. Is centipede a good candidate for this area? Centipede grass? Well, um, It, it, is, it is not widely found here yet. Uh, some people, when I've given these classes, uh, a few, and I mean like two or three people over the last 10 years, have had either Centipede or St. Augustine, uh, but it, it just isn't warm enough yet in this area for those grasses to do real well. But 10 years from now, who knows? So okay. that's my answer. Is uh, Augustine a good grass for shade? And is it a fescue? And I don't know the answer to that one is no, it's not a fescue. Well, St. Augustine, it, it's, it's not a fescue. It's a warm season grass. And give us your, uh, Give us your name and your email address and we can send you a lawn calendar for St. Augustine. Okay. 
Um, we had a grass a grass sod installer to tell us to lay sod between October and March. I noticed that you said between May and August, what would be the difference or might be the difference in the recommendation? Well, if he, I'm gonna, I'm, uh, I'm gonna speculate here. Uh, the, well, I'm not speculating on this part. The best time to put it down is May through the end of the, the beginning of August. That's the best time. You can put it down at other times of the year. And I suspect, however, that he would like you to put it down uh, uh, over the winter sometime because he's not as busy then. Uh, but what, what you're gonna find is he puts it down and because it's dormant, the roots aren't going into the soil. Now, now, starting about now is when those, uh, well, it'll, it'll start emerging from dormancy in about a, about a month or so, and then the roots will become active. Uh, but so he, he could plant, he could put, put the sod down over the winter, uh, but it, it would just, it would be, be better for you and the grass if he did it in May or June or July. If he gives you a good deal, fine. How about it? Um, is there any harm in overseeding Bermuda with ryegrass in the fall? I assume you mean an annual rye. Probably, yeah. Now, from the little that I've heard about that, uh, you can do it, but ultimately, after about, from what I understand, after about three or four years of doing that, it does start to deteriorate the, the Bermuda grass or the zoysia grass somewhat. Uh, when I came down here as a, as a Yankee in 2007, I said, boy, I'd really love to have a green, uh, uh, green grass over the, over, the winter, over, over the winter time. And yet, as I realized how intense our summer heat is and Bermuda and Zoysia are so good at that, the, the fact that it's, it, it's dormant in the winter time and straw color doesn't bother me at all. Was this person asking about tall fescue, Mary? Um, it does not say. No, it's, it's, it's winter rye. So I with, assume that with with what with Bermuda, sorry, with Bermuda, with yeah. Bermuda. I, I I personally would not recommend it, but you could could do it. Uh, some golf courses do that, but they 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 spend so much time and money and baby their grasses. Uh, you know they know they're the experts and know exact, exactly what they can get away with. Uh, I personally wouldn't recommend. Okay, awesome. So um, we're we're running really late. I think that we'll wrap it up here. Um, for anyone who's left over, we will be posting the Q and A out on the website and on YouTube. Um, and we also are going to be sending out a follow up link to the presentation handouts um, with a follow up email, probably tomorrow. So. Um, Thank you very much, John. This has been very enlightening. You're welcome. And please fill out the survey, the, the recommendations form. All right. Thanks, everyone.